Hi there and welcome to a special edition of World Sport. I'm Don Riddell and today we're going to be discussing the power of sport to take a positive role in our lives and in this world. Joining us here in the studio is the former NBA player, a qualified psychologist and best-selling author, John Amici. Uh, I think I'm actually known as quite a sceptic <laughs> of the power of sport, but I've been really reassured lately and we've seen some great stories, some great examples of people, athletes, um, well-known athletes, but also just people within their communities using sport to try and change their world. Sport goes beyond borders, but its own borders make it unique. The touchline, the baseline, the boundary. Within those confines, it may be a battlefield, but there is dignity, camaraderie, self-respect, and mutual respect. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from, take the field and you can be a someone. Young athletes are learning lessons for life. It's not enough to be faster, higher or stronger. They're taught to be hard, but fair. Sport is educational, communal and inspirational. In these troubled times, sport is here to remind us that there is a better way. The stakes couldn't be any higher, but among the most senior figures in world sport, the standards could hardly be lower. We've spent the last year squabbling about how much air was in a football, Soccer's most powerful administrators have been named, shamed and arrested. And the so-called spiritual leader of athletics stands accused of covering up a massive doping scandal. And just when the world of sport was at its most vulnerable, sport itself was under attack. After the massacre in Paris, sport hardly mattered. A trivial pursuit, more of an escape from the rigors of daily life. But actually, it never mattered more. London's Wembley Stadium became a cathedral of solidarity. All rivalry set aside as France and England stood shoulder to shoulder. England's usually partisan fans belting out a rousing rendition of La Marseillaise. It was united. It was defiant. Of all the incredible events we've witnessed this year, that game, John, at Wembley between England and France really does stand out as just an incredible moment. What were your thoughts watching that game? Well, let's put it this way. This is one of the first times I tuned in to a football match. I, I just thought, you, you talk about people taking real responsibility for their sport, real agency. Um, what happened on, on, on that pitch in terms of the way people were dotted around in... in really showing their, their, their communality. It wasn't just a stunt. I think it was an indication of people deciding to take control using sport. The fact that people in the stands got together and put aside the pettiness, the clannishness that anybody yeah. knows can happen, especially between England and France, um, to, to, to come together and sing a song together. I think that showed what happens when you decide to be a custodian of your sport, when you want sport to be the very pinnacle of the best of us. You said that everybody kind of took responsibility that day, that the fans with the singing, the players with the way it, they interacted, the organizers playing the national anthem and, and organizing the sequence. We spoke with the Belgium captain, Vincent Kompany, um, after these attacks. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting what he had to say. Sportsmen in general aren't that outspoken, but what Kompany had to say to our Amanda Davis was really worth listening to. Let's take a look. We've got a system of youth houses that is very popular in Belgium, but still, you know, it's all about kids from one area, staying in one area. And even if you go to the encounter of other people with this group, you're still within your group. And this is what I like about football sometimes a lot, is that you've got all the colours and all the cultures in one team, but ultimately whether, whether you wear blue or red is what, what's going to decide who you're going to support. If a black guy on a red team is bullying someone on your team that's white or any other color of the world, you'll defend the guy on your team. It's as simple as that. And again, I, I really think we should make this dis distinction, and not just in Brussels, to be honest. If, if I look at it in Manchester as well, you know, in big cities, you know, you need to force people to get out of the comfort zone and meet each other, be together and be on the same side. That's really important. Well, such a powerful message from Vincent Company there. It sounds so obvious, but what do you think we can learn from that? I, mean, I think what I love about what he's talking about is that the, 
the job he's talking about sport doing is making people realize that the difference between us is kind of contextual. It doesn't have to just be a question of your race and sexuality or nationality. It can be that you come together under this red shirt. Uh, and when you're in this red shirt, you are all one. You are all together. I love the fact that he highlights some of the conflicts that can happen within teams because of the way society is. But what it really highlights to me is how, much, how special coaches have to be in order to handle that. So, yes, sport can be used to, to change the context, to make people realize they belong in a different way than perhaps they had in the past, but there'll still be conflict. And that's why coaches have to be more than some guy or girl who's going to uh, teach you how to do a layup or, or, or cross a football. It's actually going to be a, a job that is far broader than that, to help you understand how to work together, to, to, to come together and become a real team. You played for several professional teams, NBA here in the United States. You were an outsider with an English accent, the only English guy playing in the league. Um, were there any experiences with coaches where you saw how they were able to integrate all these different people from different backgrounds and, and make it work as a team? Yeah, I mean, my best year in the league, which is not particularly saying much, um, was with, with the Orlando Magic. And we had this remarkably diverse team. The, the, it, we had a, a French Muslim on the team. We had a, a Mormon. We had a, a guy who was an amazing bloke who came straight out of the film Boys in the, in the Hood. <laughs> and, and then myself, which is you know, a weird outlier for, for any team. And we came together under this one banner at the Magic with a coach that said, I'm going to tell you that these are the criteria that make you one of us your effort on the floor, showing up on time, really basic stuff that allowed us to ignore the fact that this guy's name was a bit weird or this guy pronounces stuff a bit differently or this guy is just out of here. Yeah. But rather, we, these criteria made us the team. And, and I tell you, I've never been on a unit before that is so tight that had each other's backs in such a way, despite the fact that we didn't know each other. The other thing that happens in that environment is that you stop being satisfied with knowing surface stuff about people and you actually want to know a little bit more about them. You want to understand a little bit more about them. I remember being called to come down to breakfast together and any NBA player will tell you, it is rare. We spend so much time together, we don't mm -hmm. necessarily want to expand that time. Being called down to breakfast uh, on the road with my teammates sat around a table, not all of them, but half the team sat around a table with like 15 different types of tea because they'd seen that I drink tea all the time. They were going to try some tea each. <laughs> and you suddenly realize that as trite and ridiculous as this is, this is a bonding exercise that shows your difference is important to us. It's kind of cool. It is. Who's the coach, by the way? And, and did you, were you kind of aware of the fact that this was happening when it was happening? Yeah, the coach that year was, was Doc Rivers. Uh, he was the coach of the year that year, yeah. in fact. Um, I think he's far more explicit now about the ways that he tries to create teams, some of the, the methods he uses. Back then it, it, it seemed very organic, but the one thing that was clear is he did say, this is our team, this is what we stand for, and this is how we show we're bought in. And if you follow these behaviors, behaviors that anyone can follow, so they are inclusive in that sense, it's just a question of effort and focus. That's how he did it. And any coach can do that in any scenario. But it is harder work than just saying, throw the ball out and whoever's talented will manage. Still ahead, John Amici takes us on an inspirational journey to meet the man he says was pivotal, not just in starting his NBA career, but also changing his life. Welcome back to this special edition of World Sport. John Amici and myself are discussing the power of sport and the power that sport can have to make a positive difference in this world. And I want to tell you a little story about this man next to me, and it really is the mark of the man. Back in 2000, John, you were playing for the Orlando Magic. You were earning good money, but a modest salary in the NBA, and you were offered $17 million to move to the Lakers, mm -hmm. and he turned it down. Why? I turned it down because um, the year that I got the offer from the Lakers, I got an offer from tons of other teams. Uh, I would be in my house in the summertime and jerseys from other teams with my name on the back would show up. Um, but I reflected that the year before, I couldn't beg anybody to give me a job. In fact, the only coach that was interested, and it really was Doc Rivers um, and not really the organization, 
And, and so it wasn't, people think it's about loyalty, and it really isn't that. It's simply that I bang on all the time about being a person of principle. And regardless of what I wanted, and I can tell you quite factually, that everything I wanted was to go to the Lakers. I knew the Lakers would win three more championships. I knew that they would win if I sat on the bench, if I reclined at home <laughs> while they did it, I knew they would win. But I also knew that Orlando asked me to stay, and the year before, no one else had given me a shot. So you can't be a part-time man of principle. And that's why I stayed with, with Orlando. Where do you think those principles come from? Certainly, I was fortunate to have a great mum, and she instilled some of those. But also, I look back on my career, and I didn't just have great coaches. I had truly holistic coaches who had my best interest on and off the court and for my future in their mind. It's remarkable at Penn State, certainly. Toledo, Ohio, certainly. And then at the very beginning, I had a man who wasn't even my coach, who I didn't know about until much later on, when I reached out to America to try and find a coach who would take me mm. in high school. I got two replies from Toledo, Ohio, which I thought was just you know, my great writing. And I find out instead, this coach, Bob Martin, had gone to his network and said, this is a great kid, give him a chance. And to this day, there are hundreds of coaches in England who take total credit <laughs> for my moderate success. <laughs> And this man has never done that, and still to this day will not. He's the one man who should take credit. I love basketball. I think it's a great game. It's my whole life. I want to give back to the ones who don't have the advantages that others do. You don't meet a coach like Bob Martin every day. 25 years ago, he went out of his way to help start my basketball career. There was nothing in it for him. No paycheck, no credit. He just cared and wanted to help a kid with a little bit of talent. And that just about sums him up. For the past 15 years, he's worked as a basketball coach in Doncaster in Northern England. The club he started, the Danem Eagles, have become a force in the UK, winning countless titles. But more importantly than that, Bob's become a pillar of the community, coaching and mentoring children in dozens of local schools. It's very clear you're invested in, in every kid who comes to the door. What, what makes you keep that in mind every time? I think the most important thing is to work with kids, change their lives. And this is the honest truth all the way. If I see somebody that's a, and I can spot them now after all these years, I, it's a bit vulnerable. They might not, they're, they're somebody who are obviously shy, obviously not a front runner. They're going to be a front runner with me, period. Ready, stance. All right, the second thing is moving the feet. The one thing about you is that every, you know every kid's name. You slap every kid five. You, 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 can, you tailor what you do for each of them. So what would you say to these coaches who maybe have lost that perspective? They're missing a really good time. <laughs> and if they've lost that perspective, then they need to maybe backtrack a bit and think, uh, remember where they came from. He was in the NBA, and he's just picked you as captain. Spending the day with Bob is inspiration. By mid-afternoon, he's already been to four schools, and just seeing the way the kids are with him says it all. You, get up here then! Yeah! Yes! But all of the work and trust that Bob has developed over the past decade is now under threat. Budget cuts mean his job will no longer exist in 2016. After being embedded in this place, in this community for this long, how, does that, how did that strike you? How does it make you feel? When it happened, it was done so quickly. You know, a call in the morning at 8, eight o'clock, up to the office at 9, you're gone at 9.20. You know, it was like somebody just hit me with a shovel right in the face. I don't make a great deal of money. I've never even, to be honest, I don't know how much I make. I do now because of all this. I never looked at my paychecks. I just did it because I love doing it. While the news has obviously hit Bob hard, it's amazing to see how he's coping with the situation. The memories of what he's achieved at Danem give him so much pride, and he's as positive as ever. 
I didn't even see this here. I, have, I remember when this article came out in the Toledo Blade, uh, and I was so proud. It was the first time I got any press, but I didn't realize you, you had a copy. Oh, I kept that. It's not bad. That's a long time ago. That is a long time ago. I still had, well, hair. We've got a lot of tradition, and it's been a fantastic run of, you know, like what we do, and that's why it, it, it ain't coming to an end. You're not done yet. No, it ain't coming to an end. You're not done yet. Had a really good day. It has been a good day. You see, we need more coaches like that. that and, and understand that my admiration for him is not based on what I know now he did for me at the very beginning. We need more coaches who know the name of every kid who goes through their door and slaps them a high five, who understands that young people come to them at whatever time of day, having had a day, and that day may not have been as good as they would have liked. They've had an experience before that. They've come from a home. Many, we know many of these will not be ideal. They've gone to a school which may not be ideal, mm -hmm. or they may just not have a, an ideal school experience. Maybe they're average. And the truth is, in the Western world, the consequence of being average is that you are invisible. Their one hope in that day is that they come to you and you see them. And that's an awesome responsibility. But if you can do that, the, the, the impact you can have is remarkable. Our, as coaches, we can be that person that sees them and tells them, no, 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 for this two hours, you and your teammates is all that matters. And if you do that, that is indelible. These memories are forever. Sport has the power to change the lives of people all over the world, whatever their background. Coming up, we follow the journey of one young man from war-torn Africa for whom football isn't just a pastime, it's a lifeline. Uh, welcome back to this special edition of World Sport. Today, John Amici and myself have been discussing the power of sport and the role it can play in making our world a better place. We've heard about how it can be healing, unifying, inspirational. The medium of sport can also be transformational. Patrick Snell has the story. Never give up. What are you fighting for? Never give up. What are you willing to fight for? Adam Ahmed Adam arrived in the United States in 2009 as a refugee from Sudan's war-torn Darfur to embark on a new life in a new country, though the one he left behind is never ever far from his thoughts. In Africa, you never know what is going to happen tomorrow. And the life in Africa is kind of dangerous. People seeing every single day people are dying or gunshot is going on every single minute you can hear. Amid all the devastating scenes of chaos and mayhem, there is, however, one moment from Adam's life that remains forever indelibly etched in his memory. Age of eight, my dad got assassinated inside my house. So they were not able to find who did it exactly, and it was kind of craziest moment in my family. Right now, today, I'm the like father, because all the sisters I have, they are young, and I'm the oldest brother here, so I have to stand up and, you know, tell the thing, the right thing to do. Transitioning to life in America would initially prove no easy feat for Adam and his family. Economic, cultural and language barriers made it particularly challenging. But Adam found a breakthrough in adapting to life in the US through the Soccer in the Streets program, an organization that's been helping teenagers for more than a quarter of a century. He ended up here uh, six years ago and has just developed into the great young man he is now. For me now, being into the second street and coaching, this is something like new life to me. Because every time when I step here and I meet somebody new, like somebody new, and they get to talk to me, they was like, we want to play for the team. I never say no. Come join us. Just let us um, sometimes just be together and like, he talked to us like we're his little brother. He told me if I want to play for college, I need to get a good GPA and good grades. I want to help and play in this team. And when I be like Adam, I can coach the kids that will be coming here. Adam is really the example of what we hope happens for any young person that comes through our program where they're able to gain skills and confidence, be the leader for the next generation of young people. Side, side. How would you describe your life journey? 
When I was coming from Sudan as a refugee, because life was so sad. But today, every time when I step into the community, I get happy. I start with sad, ending with happiness. This is how my life looks today. See, for me, that is sport at its best. And I'm, I'm not trying to besmirch his technical ability as a coach, but nobody looks at that story and thinks that his ability to help a kid, a kid go through those cones is somehow the, the formative thing here. There's a young man who has clearly embraced the idea of coach as educator, uh, coach as mentor, coach as father figure, and that's when sport really is activated. In of itself, it is a, a super tanker you know, that we fill with what we want it to, to, to embody. Uh, and he clearly has taken sport and said, I am going to use it to transform the lives of, of the people around me who can look up to me, but also learn through this, you know, this, 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 in, this environment of sport. Yeah. And this is one of the things I really love about sport. It doesn't matter where you're from. Once you cross the line, once you cross the boundary, once you go into that gym maybe for the first time, as, as you did, mm -hmm. Everything can change. You can go from being a nobody or somebody who maybe doesn't fit in, but you can become a somebody, right? This is the thing. Sport can alter your very identity. But when I was seven years old, I thought it was a monster because I was the, the biggest, blackest, fattest thing anybody had ever seen in Stockport. <laughs> no, there was nobody like me. And, and because of how I looked, people would run away. They would cross the street. They would imagine all kinds of stuff about me, like I'm going to take their wallet off them or something. Right. And then suddenly... You know, at the age of 17, I am asked to go to this random gym in the middle of Cholton in, in Manchester, and I walk in the door there, and all of a sudden I am surrounded by a group of strangers who look at me in a way that I have never been looked at before. How? All, all of a sudden, I stopped being a freak, I stopped being a monster, and I became a commodity. I looked in the faces of my teammates as they became and I, all I could see was my own potential. There, there is nothing quite like that. I love sport. I played it, I've spent my career talking about it, mm -hmm. but I'm becoming a bit of a cynic. I've met match fixers. I spend a lot of time now being cynical, talking about corruption. I want to believe the magic though. Mm -hmm. How optimistic are you for the future? I think it's easier at a time like this to be truly cynical yeah. and, and worry. There are definitely people leading sport who are the wrong sort of character in every way. Um, sport has got a great future if we're willing to take some individual responsibility. It's easy nowadays to say, as a fan, for example, or as a local community coach, what can I do? You know, it's all the money from television and sponsors. It's all the, the big actors in these big offices in Switzerland mm. or whatever. But it's not. It's also us. If we decide we are going to be the custodians of sport and we will make sure with every act, whether it be how we behave on the sideline of our children's game, whether we are animals on the sideline or whether we understand that we are part of how this game and the experience of these young people, if we decide to take control, to be true stewards, to be true custodians, then we can change sport. And, and as as people rise through it, we will find that administrators and leaders within sport become better and better. That's a perfect way to leave it. John, thanks very much. Thank you.